I'm Heather Granado. I'm the head of content at Vita Foods, and we're delighted to in Geneva for Vita Foods Europe 2022, and to our watchers online for our uh, live stream that's going out. Uh, show opened this morning at 9.30. There was a 5K run. There were some really fast runners. Um, I was the very loud American cheering for them, so you go. Uh, Lonza, in particular, had an entire team of people with their shirts, so uh, they're getting their steps in. Rick is shaking his head no. Um, hall is open until 6 o'clock today, open tomorrow morning at 9.30, and then open until 4.00. So we will have all of this content available after the event on demand. So do take some time to catch up on what you didn't get a chance to see. You are joining us for our session on Getting Personal, How the Pharma Nutra Crossover is Affecting the Personalized Nutrition Space. And in the next two hours, we're going to uh, have a ton of great information. Our speakers will include Isabella Davis, the Senior Project Manager and Research Associate at Nutrition Business Advisors, Karen Verzijan, Close. She's like, eh, no, not really. Partner at Axon Lawyers. Uh, Ken Israel, founder and co-founder, Innovation Nutrition Consulting and Beyond Brands. Mike Wakeman, pharmacist and healthcare consultant and chair of the Guild of Health Writers. Rick Miller, food and drink associate editor at Mintel. And James Bowley, the chief development offer at Hologram Sciences. And the chair for our session today, Stephen Beveridge, who is the external innovation and partnering leader for digestive and nutritional health at Bayer's Consumer Health Division. He has more than 20 years of experience in innovation and new product development around nutritional supplements, digestive health and beverages, with a broad geo focus covering Europe, North America, LATAM, and APAC markets. And Stephen, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Heather. And welcome to everybody. So uh, thank you uh, to the audience online and uh, on site here. And, um, we have three presentations and then we have a panel discussion in the second hour. And so the first presentation is from Rick Miller, uh, Food and Drink Associate Director at Mintel. Rick is responsible for developing thought leadership content in specialized nutrition uh, for Mintel food and drink clients by providing actionable insights on trending topics such as infant and maternal nutrition and foods for special diets. Rick, stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, and uh, it's a welcome from me. Uh, it's so nice to be here and to see uh, people young, uh, older and, and newer and familiar faces around the world. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today about uh, personalized nutrition. Um, I'm here today with my colleague uh, Soren, so if you would like to hear more about uh, Mintel and the services we offer in terms of market intelligence, please do grab him, tackle him before we leave so that you can speak to him and hear more about our amazing services. Um, so without further ado, Let's talk about the global overview of this amazing market and why I think it's really the next big nutrition opportunity for you and your, and your business. So I'm going to cover kind of three major areas today. First of all, I'm going to talk about why it's now the time to actually engage in this particular area. Um, and then I'm going to, in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how it's evolving, how things are diversifying. Um, and then in the last part of the presentation, talk about where things might go next as a category. Um, because if you were in the last uh, presentation uh, with Eric Pierce uh, from the Nutrition Business Journal and Informer Insights, you'll know that obviously this category continues to be huge and it's growing um, across all the different regions of the world. So let's start off by convincing you why is now the time to engage. Well, first of all, it's the fact that we're in a culture now of me. It's all about me and what I would like and why, why things should be personalized to my uh, particular likings, taste, uh, health, um, my goals. Um, but this has been proven also scientifically that over the course of the last sort of 50 to 60 years, each successive generation of consumers is becoming more and more individualistic. And that's based on mostly socioeconomic profiles. And even from our own consumer data, as you can see here with French consumers, if you look at the 16 to 24 age bracket or the Gen Z uh, category, you'll see that I like to stand out from the crowd describes them very, very well, as opposed to those who are slightly older who might feel that that's not necessarily the case. And we've been talking about this for some time at Mintel through our trends um, team and analysts from around the world. The make it mine um, trend really shows that consumers are yearning after that level of personalization and that the kind of one size fits all is really dead for, for many sorts of categories, or at least it's going to die out potentially within the future. 
And certainly that doesn't just mean around, you know, picking what sort of flavors and what sort of, uh, you know, packaging you might like or what sort of colors you might like. It's also around the nutrients that are in there as well. In fact, when we've looked at a variety of different consumers from around Europe, you can see here from this, this data that, again, um, across all the major European markets, um, the majority of younger consumers by the darker blue bar, again, would like to try food and drink that's personalized uh, to their diet, to their activity levels, um, based, on, uh, based on their individual health needs. Um, and understandably, we can see that older European consumers are a little bit more hesitant in that area. So really, you can see this in two ways. The big growth category is certainly with our younger consumers, and our older consumers maybe need a little bit more convincing in this area to make sure, because again, they may be well be um, those with greater health needs, certainly in the future. And if we think about it as well, why these younger consumers want that, it's not just the fact that they're just becoming more individualistic over time. It's the type of media that, again, that they're consuming. You can kind of boil it down to this sort of Netflix generation, you know, media on demand, I want the program at this time. Maybe some of us here can remember that when television only had a few channels and you had to just watch what was on there. Not anymore. The average consumer now can pick what they want when they want it. And so that, again, extends into the sorts of things that they they eat and drink. So again, they feel that maybe their personal identity is defined by the sorts of things that they eat and drink. Again, they were more interested in foods that are personalized to flavor, and certainly nutrition, again, is alongside the sorts of things that they would be interested in too. And of course, there are going to be data protection concerns. With all this sharing of information, again, when we look at some of the devices and the sorts of services that are on offer, there is a sort of a to and fro that needs to come with these different services. Consumers still want to engage with these sorts of things. Again, we can see here in the UK, 73% of uh, UK consumers said that they'd like more, uh, sorry, US consumers would like more products tailored to their individual needs in the drinks area. And it increases more with their children, as you can see. So this is also being compounded by um, parents of this generation as well, that personalization is something that we want to extend to our, to our children. And similarly in the UK, uh, those who are using vitamins, minerals, and supplements, again, would like uh, those that are personalized to their needs. And even in China, again, 84% of dieters would be interested in uh, foods that have been created by nutritionists or, again, have meal plans that are catered to their exact needs. So what, again, is actually available in the marketplace? Again, many of you may even be by have tried some of these uh, particular services over time, but we can sort of summarize it into four major approaches. And again, some of, the, some of the language, again, will be maybe similar or maybe slightly different with, with my uh, co-panelists today, but um, I think there's a lot of continuity, which is, which is quite striking. So the first one is on the top left, which is a sort of assessment-based service. So that's the broadest category. It's effectively where a brand or a service is, is asking the consumer to share data, you know, their height, their weight, their goals, their, maybe their gender. Um, and again, that's customizing the service to them. Going around in a clockwise direction, you then have Products that, again, or services that take samples or biological data. And that might be genetics-based data, it might be microbiome-based data, and then it might be also things that we're more commonly aware of, so biomarkers like urine or, again, using blood, um, again, to create products and services that go with that. But really, what actually enriches part of this journey is not just sharing of that data, it's, the, it's the, the wearables that go along with it. So again, many of you today, if I look down at the audience, I can see that some people are wearing things like Apple Watches. They might even be wearing other devices as well. And these smart wearables, again, are just providing that continuous stream of physiological data that enriches this journey. Um, and they're becoming more and more sophisticated as we go along. Yes, there are definitely problems with some of the, uh, the quality of the data. Um, but I hope to convince you that our consumers certainly uh, do believe in them. So we have everything from uh, products, again, as you can see here, Lumen, which helps to hack the metabolism, again, by uh, take, taking a, uh, a scientific approach called indirect calorimetry, measuring inspired um, oxygen versus expired carbon dioxide. We have the Aura Ring, which again is similar to products like the uh, Apple Watch uh, or Whoop, which again tracks heart rate variability or even things like continuous blood, uh, gl blood glucose monitoring by Super Sapiens, which again uses Abbott's, Abbott's um, Libra device as well. So again, lots of different health areas being tracked and lots of different devices which again consumers are engaging with. But do they actually trust them? So when we've asked our consumers about wearable devices from across the world, we can see here that the majority of consumers, certainly in the US, 62% of them who own a smartwatch, um, use it to monitor their health. 
that's quite interesting because only 25% actually buy it as a fashion device or just a fashionable item that's on their wrist. So they clearly do have some sort of goal uh, associated with these devices. Again, in China, we can see here that a large majority of consumers, again, are buying these devices to support their weight management journey. And again, they intend to buy them in the next 12 months. And then again, in, from the US, again, our black consumers, again, feel that COVID-19 has actually increased their interest in wearables um, and that could potentially detect um, health issues as well. And some of these um, companies have started to add that into some of the metrics that they provide to consumers, saying that you may be starting to become ill. And so these are the sorts of things you might want to consider. So it's not only just data for the sake of data, there's a predictive side of it, which again, I think is going to be coming in the next few years. But if we break it down into our specific categories, which all of us are much more familiar with, things like protein powders definitely seem to be a bit of a niche category for the time being. Certainly when I was writing my uh, specialized nutrition report in 2020, the future of, um, it was something that was really exciting that I was looking forward to. Unfortunately, you know, a couple of years on, we haven't really seen uh, the number of product examples on the market that we, would, that we might have expected. And the, probably the reason for that is because um, a large number of the, uh, the brands that are actually putting out these um, products, um, they're already uh, suppliers or distributors of, of major, major brands. So they have the capacity to be able to provide personalized nutrients to the consumer on demand. And unless brands are going to get into this area um, and be able to adapt to those different um, processes, it's going to be difficult to break into the market. But certainly in Southeast Asia, we started to see some, some growth in that area. Um, Nourished Asia is one example which has started to, to offer uh, personalized uh, meal replacement powders. And they're doing it with a variety of different mediums, like milk, coffee, juice, all these sorts of different things as well. So it's not completely dead, but it's some, some sort of area that, again, needs, again, a little bit more growth. And some big players, I think, coming in and offering a personalized example are going to really take it to the next level. But the big area at the moment is micronutrients. Micronutrients are definitely dominating the personalized nutrition space at the moment. Even if we just look to Europe, and just there are loads and loads of different brands um, in this space. Um, again, Vitamin Manager in Sweden, we have uh, Lauvi as well in Switzerland right here, um, and we have Cure as well from France. Again, using a combination of either the assessment-based approach or again using biomarkers like blood and urine to provide personalized nutrition solutions to the consumer. The interesting thing with many of these brands as well is that they use that subscription model, which again, if we go back to our Netflix generation of consumers, very familiar uh, territory as well for that subscription model. Again, so at reducing that cost of entry as well, which is something I'll come back to in a minute. Something quite interesting as well is, is brands playing around with formats as well. So again, if we look at Nourished, who are a UK personalized VMS company, and they offer a person, a, a 3D printed gummy, which is in a stack format. They've recently um, expanded into children's uh, supplements as well, which I think is very interesting. But again, with a smaller number of different um, options that you, can, that you can do, obviously probably for safety reasons as well. But again, they have pre-made stacks or again, completely personalized the, those nutritional needs. So we're not limited by the things that we can, we can offer uh, consumers. One thing I'd like to put to you though, is that it's not just again, thinking about providing complete nutrition in one particular service or supplement or powder or capsule. There is another way to think about this as well. And I think uh, Mixfit is something that's worth looking at as well as a brand who are trying to do things from a different direction. So for those of us who, uh, who might remember soda streams, you might, there might be some, uh, uh, some crossover or it might look a little bit familiar. Um, Mixfit basically is a personalized nutrition solution that attempts to fill in the gaps in terms of nutrient needs for the consumer. So taking all these different insights from the wearables to dietary information, the, the Mixfit machine puts those nutrients into a single drink, which fills in those gaps for the consumer. So it makes it more integrative into the consumer's day. And I think that's very interesting because um, in a recent interview, um, uh, Mixfit actually stated um, that they, they were looking to create this as a, a bit of an ecosystem. So this is kind of this discussion around the internet of things or these devices that are constantly talking to each other. And I know Isabella's got some insights that maybe she'll be talking about that later on in her presentation as well. But with all these things, I mean, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what about, you know, all these, the urine and the blood and things like that, you know, 
the consumer is going to want to engage with these sorts of things? Well, if you think about the last couple of years, we've all had to you know, shove things up our nose to like, do PCR tests and all these sorts of things. So I think the invasiveness barrier has started to fall for many consumers. They're used to taking samples. If we'd asked them pre-COVID-19, probably the, the vast majority would have said, no, I'm not going to give you any of my biological data. You're not a doctor. You know, it's not something I'm going to share with you. But I think now, I think uh, consumers are a lot more uh, likely to do so. So that's a much... Uh, a much better scenario for brands who want to jump into this area. And so we're seeing innovation in terms of sampling methods from around the world as a consequence. Um, Bayes are a good example. They use a no-touch um, system for taking bloods, which again is just a device that goes onto the arm and takes the blood sample directly from the consumer so they don't have to sit there with you know, blood tests and sticking it on papers and all this sort of thing. Food Marble is another in interesting uh, brand. Um, again, they're trying to look at um, bacterial dysbiosis in the gut, so sort of functional gut uh, disorder territory, looking at gases that are being produced and then obviously giving actionable insights to the consumer. And then Viome, I think, are a really nice example of that microbiome-based um, supplement company, and they produce a personalized pre and probiotics based on their gut intelligence profile, which they, again, is produced as a report. So again, samples, sampling, markers, and even delivery systems are all evolving um, over the course of time. So what's that roadmap? How, how are we going to get more, more consumers to jump on and, do, and provide more of their samples? It needs to be proven testing methods, things that, again, consumers can reliably put their trust into in terms of the scientific method. It needs to align with current diet trends or health trends, so things like gut health um, or certainly the ketogenic diets or any of these things that they're very familiar with at the moment. And then obviously affordability. And as I mentioned, that subscription model seems to be something that many brands are engaging with because consumers and certainly in that younger category, are very familiar with that type of payment method and it makes it a lot more affordable for them to engage with this area. Healthcare professionals are definitely something that needs to be considered in this area. You need that affirmation from somebody who has the credibility to talk to consumers about health. So if it just comes directly from the brand, maybe there's, maybe there's some skepticism there. If it comes from somebody in a white coat, maybe who's uh, got MD after their name, I think that changes the dynamic completely. And certainly some brands have used that approach completely. If we think of Persona, who have recently been acquired by Nestle, they use um, healthcare professionals as part of that assessment process, which again, makes it a lot more uh, palatable, I think, for consumers who are worried about that, that side of things. So just a couple more slides just to talk about where, that, where the category might go next. So we've already had a think about this. Obviously, as I said, one of the things that we, we do very, very well at Mintel is we help to make predictions based on previous trends that we've set in the past. And one that I think is key to the personalization area is smart diets. Smart diets is one of our, tw our 2030 uh, trends, um, global food and nutrition trends. And from smart diets, we've made some predictions that the, mass, the, the advent of mass personalization is likely to take place by the end of the decade, just based on the, the uptake and the innovation that's coming over the last uh, few years. And we're certainly going to see even more rapid uptake because of COVID-19 and, and that change in the innovation pace that's going on. But obviously, many of you here are thinking about what, what about that mass audience? You know, you, you've, shown, you've shown us, Rick, you know, loads of really niche examples. Um, you know, we've got things in the top left-hand corner. We've got high personalization, but a very niche audience. You know, that's things like Nourished, as I talked about, you know, small numbers of consumers. We've got products that have got low personalization, again, but a, but a niche audience as well. So it might be changing the color or the flavor on a, on a, on a particular brand or a packet. But what we're really trying to, to move into is that kind of top right-hand corner, the high personalization and mass audience. That's the big golden space. That's the golden ticket for the future. And how are we going to do that? So there are three challenges that I think that we need to overcome for it to become mainstream. The first is to shift a lot of the uh, current data collection methods from retrospective to real time. Now, obviously for some things that's going to be quite tricky. Um, certainly things like uh, nutrients are not easy to detect in real time. Certainly that's a, that's a, that's a trouble. But even things like collecting personal data, um, things like blood glucose monitoring, heart rate variability, that needs to come more and more and more as we move into the, into the future. These need to become commonplace. Secondly, we need to take the burden off the consumer. We need to bring things into an always-on monitoring territory. The more that a consumer has to do in order to input their data or to share information, that's going to make it more difficult for them and less likely are they going to engage with it. It needs to be so easy, it's almost subconscious. And then the last bit is that there needs to be that integration of the big data sets. And I think some of you may be taking a sharp intake of breath and thinking, big data? 
oh, I'm not so sure about that. There might be some, uh, some concerns around that, maybe legal concerns. But some brands certainly in the US have started to do this as part of their, um, their kind of entry point into using the service. So Zoe is a good example that you might want to look at. Uh, they're a microbiome testing company um, that started off um, as, a, again, a, a, a kind of a scientific uh, action group. And they use personalization as part of the entry point. So in order for a consumer to use Zoe, they must um, be willing to share their data um, as part of an ongoing uh, accumulation of data package. So again, this is probably where the category has to go in order for us to get into that mass market. So thanks very much, guys, for listening. Just to summarize, I think now really is the time for you guys to be thinking about this area, and we'd love to keep um, talking to you and, and, and engaging with you on this amazing area. Like I said, my colleague Soren is here to answer any questions about our insights and our services. I think it's a really diverse category, and you're going to hear more from our rest of our panelists about how just how diverse and exciting it is. And I think the future is bright. We are going to reach the mass market. It's just a case of how many people and when and how much data our consumers are willing to share. So thank you so much for listening. My name's Rick Miller. I think we could potentially take a quick question or two, you yeah. think, Stephen? If anybody has one. Everybody just wants to rush the stage and ask their questions individually. I know how that is. <laughs> OK, Rick, we're going to let you off the stage then. Thank you very much, Rick. So the next presentation is going to be from uh, Isabella Davies. She's a senior project manager and research associate with uh, Nutrition Business Advisors. Isabella Davis works with the team and nutrition business advisors to uncover today's trends in wellness and tomorrow's best nutrition business opportunities. She's earned a bachelor's degree in nutritional sciences from the University of California, Berkeley, focusing on human physiology and metabolism. While science is a principal discipline, she has intensively studied business in postgraduate coursework and through real-world practice. Stage is yours. Thank you so much for that amazing intro, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Isabella Davis. I'm all the way from San Diego, California. So thank you so much to Heather for having me. And congratulations on putting together such an amazing session. I'm going to try to get my first slide up here. But uh, Rick just did sort of a very perfect overview from the consumer perspective. And I'm about to do a similar overview of the personalized nutrition space from a business perspective. So I'm going to be showing you why is this such an interesting opportunity for a business person and really why you should be excited about this market. Okay, so I'm with a firm called Nutrition Business Advisors. We're a market research consultancy and we are scattered across the United States with over 100 years of combined experience in the dietary supplement space. Some of you may recognize the name of my boss, Tom Arts. He was a co-founder of the Nutrition Business Journal, which if you saw Eric Pierce's presentation this morning with the market data, uh, Tom was a founder of that publication and he still gets involved in, in writing that market data, but we also do our own consulting work. And here's a photo of Tom and I at the Nutrition Business Journal Summit, which is a gathering of CEOs and executives in the dietary supplement space. It happens every year. It's exclusive and invite only. And if this sounds interesting to you, please let me know. I have some invitations. And uh, like Steven said, I have a clinical background in nutrition. And I'm now working with clients large and small, as large as Fortune 500 CPG, to as small as startups in the dietary supplement and nutrition space. So personalized nutrition is one of um, Tom's favorite topics that he's been sort of a spokesperson for for the last 20 years. And I'm going to be giving sort of the how we got to where we are today in terms of the market. Then the main part of my presentation is the market research, the market sizing. And it's really difficult to size this market because it's so new. So there's going to be a lot of background on the methodology of how we size that market. And we're going to be focusing on the US numbers. I am going to give some global context, but we are primarily doing market research on personalized nutrition in the US. And by the time I get to the takeaways, I want you to feel as excited as I am about this space and really to understand why a company 
like Nestle Health Sciences, who's right up the street from us in Switzerland, has made such a big bet in this space. So in the 90s, you could get your DNA done by Ancestry.com. And at that time, the only other thing you could really do was go to a holistic doctor, and they could do some diet-related tests. Then we had the Apple Watch come out. And this has become so popular. The adoption curve of the wearables has similar metrics to the adoption of mobile devices. 70% of Americans wear some sort of wearable to track their fitness. Quiz-based supplement companies, as, uh, as Rick said, the survey-based ones, Care of and Persona are the most popular in the US and very well known. Both have been acquired by large CPG companies. Those became popular between 2016 and 2018. And by the way, the dates in the bottom are when I think, when we think that these products or services became available and, and popularized. Uh, the next thing to happen to the market, and this is, this is really the story of how the market becomes ready. Okay, so lots of companies are trying in between and starting and failing. Uh, in 2019, Bayes got approved for their at-home blood nutrient test, and it also became possible for companies to send blood tests to the home and receive data about blood nutrients. And this really gives companies a direct way to their consumer to get the blood data, and in some ways, it's cheaper than going to a lab and getting vials of blood drawn. It has its issues as well, but it is available. Then we had the pandemic, and of course this did wonders for the industry, and it did two important things for personalized nutrition. First of all, it accelerated any technology that would do do-it-yourself or DIY, do it at home. So any kind of technology that would enable that, the pandemic accelerated the development of that technology, which is very important for personalized nutrition. Secondly, of course, it brought health and medicine to the forefront of everybody's minds. And so we've seen from 2020 till now an explosion of companies entering the marketplace with all different kinds of data points, microbiome, blood, genetics, AI and algorithms. And what we're seeing today, just recently in the last year, is a lot more collaboration between brands. And that's going to become really important in future years as Rick was also saying, the data sharing, so on and so forth. So I wanted to honor this quote. In the future, individuals will know what to eat and do based on their unique needs as indicated by sensors and biomarkers. So this is saying that people one day will know exactly what to do based on the data that they're being told in real time. And that sounds kind of unimaginable and maybe a little bit weird, but there are actually products and services being made that are getting us steps and steps closer to this. This is the CEO of Abbott. He manages $35 billion worth of health and healthcare related assets. And Abbott made strides with their diabetes glucose monitoring device, and they've now announced that they would like to put out the next best series of human performance wearables. And they're claiming that the first series of this wearable, it may be something you wear on your arm. We haven't seen what, it, what it's going to look like yet. But it is going to be able to detect ketones and lactate in the blood in real time. And that's only the first series. So who's to say what they're going to be able to come up with, given that they have a huge amount of resources, and they also have the experience with the blood uh, wearable detecting glucose in real time. This is the CEO and founder of Routine, which is a, a precision supplement company. And by the way, Rachel has been so generous and spoken to me and actually inspired some of the slides coming after this. And she says, there will be no single tracking solution. So no company, Whoop or a Ring, is going to win the whole market over. But rather, what's important is that these devices can integrate and talk to one another. So this is what I mean by that. This is kind of a visual. 
This is the internet of things. This is the sharing of the data between different brands that have different wearables and different products. Okay, so you have your fitness wearables. You have your mattress that's tracking your movement when you sleep. You have your constant blood monitoring. And then you have the connection between all these things to your Amazon account, to your doctor. And there are companies in the center that are trying to develop sort of a centralized place where you can go and you can see all this data getting aggregated. And it will actually speak something to you that's actionable. Because right now, if you have all these three things on the top, you may have to have five, six different apps on your phone with lots of different data and potentially even conflicting data. And so we need centralized data so that consumers have a good experience. Basis, for example, they are even integrating data to your calendar so they can see your work schedule. And they might predict that you're stressed because of how much you're working. And they will actually schedule a meditation on your behalf. Imagine if you could set a daily budget. I'm willing to spend $2 a day on supplements. They'll order it for you. They'll make a doctor's appointment for you if you need it. Kind of like the COO of your health, just taking care of it for you. So these are all predictions for the future. OK, oh, got to go back one. Whew. Don't get too excited about the cat. I will explain that. So wellness in Web3. If you don't understand blockchain and Web3, don't get too caught up in it. Uh, it would have to be a whole presentation on this. But the point is that the development of blockchain technology and our, our uh, evolution into Web3 from Web2 tracks with the trend of nutrition becoming more personalized. So in other words, nutrition gets more personalized as the internet gets more personalized. And the internet is getting more personalized in the sense that in Web3, it is individuals that will have their data and be able to choose whether to share it and sell it to companies. Individuals will also have many more ways to invest in brands that they resonate with. And finally, in Web3, individuals have many more ways to participate with one another and create community. A real world example and manifestation of this is Apex optimizers. So all these brands, the logos you see, have collaborated and said, we're willing to create a community wherein if people join and buy into the community, they will have access to our products for free, discounted services, access to our medical advisory board, access to the top tier athletes that we work with, and they'll be able to talk to one another and have a wonderful community of very health focused and health conscious people. So the way you buy into the community is by purchasing an NFT. And I just showed you that one. There it is. So this is mine. I bought this, this cat. And I could walk around in the metaverse as this cat. But I'm not so interested in, in that. That's not why I bought it. I bought this cat because I'm now in the community and uh, for me, you know, I, I'm a health interested person, so I love the discounts and I love the, you know, experiencing the new apps and being part of the testing community. But for business reasons, I've actually gotten to network with a lot of very interesting founders as well, specifically in personalized nutrition. I want to take a step back. That was all in the future, a little bit, two or three years in advance, a look into the future. But let's talk about where we are right now with the wearables. OK, so I just made this quickly. And uh, sleep, uh, exercise is going to be one of the most important metrics that health conscious people are going to want to track. OK, every health conscious person is really, really wanting to make sure their exercise gets tracked properly and accurately. And they don't have to log anything. They don't have to do it. It's not too much effort, right? So. I don't like this aura ring because if you're on a stationary bike doing a workout, you have to log it after because it uses motion to detect a workout. Okay, so some stationary exercise doesn't get tracked automatically. Most of the sensors 
Apple Watch, Whoop, and Aura Ring rely on motion and heart rate to track your exercise. Pretty accurate, and it's been very highly adopted by the market. And then we have sleep, which is also super important, and it's not as accurate right now. Okay, so in the lab, scientists are using brain waves to detect sleep, and right now we don't have a wearable device that detects brain waves. It's relying on heart rate variability and body temperature, which is pretty good, but not perfect. We have the glucose monitors, Levels. You've probably heard of Levels and NutriSense. That technology is very, very accurate because it comes from the diabetes management sector, and it came over and it was sort of rebranded as human performance. So it's very accurate, but potentially the data is not as interesting. And these are some other uh, functions that I've seen wearables attempt to track, uh, but they're really not that accurate right now. In an ideal world, okay, we would have a wearable that could track our hormones. We would have a wearable that could track micronutrients. And again, that sounds impossible, but there are actually products and services being made that are getting us steps and steps closer to that. Okay, so we're gonna get into the market sizing. And our job at Nutrition Business Advisors is to size niche and difficult markets in the nutrition space. And this is like getting your hands around a cloud because it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing, it's so brand new. This is a global report that says $8.2 billion is the size of the personalized nutrition industry in 2021. I'm not defending these numbers, I'm just reporting them and trying to give you some context. I've heard a lot of other numbers as well. So it's important to look at the criteria. What are they, what are they considering for this revenue? Their definition is that the companies have to be collecting health information or nutritional statuses through tests and then offering recommendations according to the data. And so NBJ is on their third report. And we come from a supplement perspective. So it's gonna be much more supplement first and testing second. We help them create the methodology for sizing this market. And here's a visual representation of that methodology, okay? So in the center, the core market, there are supplement companies selling supplements by a personalized modality. So it could be any form of testing, any of those four buckets being survey, microbiome, genetic, and blood. Could be any of those, but they're selling supplements for sure. Also included in the revenue model are companies that are testing and then giving you recommendations for supplements, but not necessarily selling the supplements. What's not included in this model is any company that maybe consumers associate with health, but if the if the recommendation doesn't actually give you some sort of regimen, it's not included. This clicker kind of has a mind of its own. I don't know, it just goes when it feels like it. So there's also a very big spectrum. And some companies, I've talked to many personalized nutrition brands, and some even feel offended that they're being put in the same class <laughs> as one another. They feel that their business model is so, so different. So we have companies that are just trying to help people with the tyranny of choice, right? You go into the store, there's way too many things, and we want to help you simplify your life. All the way to the other side of the spectrum where we want to optimize your health. We want to give you the most precise nutrition for your body as possible. So all these different business models mean that it's a hard market to size as well. And you guys can get these slides from me after, so no worries on taking pictures, but go ahead. So this is what NBJ projects for personalized supplements. These are just the sales of the supplements. Okay, so it's a small market. Just for context, here in 2021, 
we're not even to a billion dollars. And the supplement market in the US in 2021 was like $65 billion. So it's a really, really small, small, small slice of the pie. But it is growing very fast. You see it's teetering between 40 to 20% growth for the next foreseeable years, which is quite good. So this is what I did. Now, NBJ report separates, sep separates the testing from the supplements. And I wanted to put it together just so that we could see how this number compares to that 8.2 billion global number that I said at the beginning of this section. So we got the survey based. Obviously, this is a cheap method of getting personalized supplements. Cheap for the consumer, cheap for the company as well. And it's got the biggest revenue. So it's quite, it's by far the most popular. If we had, if we were able to get a map of the, the which, where the consumers are following, this bucket would be huge compared to the rest. We also, of course, have companies using biomarkers, which right now is urine and blood. Could be other fluids in the future, but right now we've got mainly urine and blood. And then genetics, and you see like routine is falling in both because they use both, oops. And this number at the bottom, if we total all of these, this is revenue from supplements and testing put together. It's, it's 1.14 billion, so it's about an eighth of the globe which makes sense. Again, I'm not defending these numbers, I'm just, I'm just reporting them, but it, it, does, it does line up. So we're gonna go uh, out of the US now, back to global, and I love this section, the funding update section, because this uh, data, I haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, we track, it first was hundreds of personalized nutrition companies, and. It's getting up to the thousands now because there are so many new companies being launched every single day. So when I did this analysis in 2020, there was about $1.695 billion of funds in the personalized nutrition space up until that time. And this is, again, the same definition, companies collecting data and then giving some sort of health recommendation based on that data selling supplements perhaps, but if they're giving a health recommendation, then it is included. And I redid that analysis just a few weeks ago, and there has been $4 billion added into the space in just two years. It's amazing. This is really, really good news because more funding means more innovation, means better services, means higher consumer adoption. So this is actually a look at some of those transactions and some of those funding rounds. I chose transactions that are closest to the dietary supplement industry because we're here at Vita Foods and I figured that would be most interesting to you. Um, Lowy, uh, Luvi actually, that's how you say it. It's a German company, they were just sold. I have, don't know for how much. Um, so that is new. And then we have OK Capsule in the US. They were a business to business, uh, supplement manufacturing company doing personalized supplements. And all these companies are from various parts of the value chain. So business to business services, enabling technologies, and brands. So I'm going to do the takeaways in reverse. So what we just talked about was that there's a lot of money going into the space. And it's coming from really credible places. Uh, investors from the healthcare industry, from g government grants, from large CPG. So it's definitely not a fad. Personalized nutrition really is going to happen big time. The market is difficult to size right now, but it's possible if you have clear parameters and a clear definition of what you're trying to size. If I would have given this presentation two years ago, I would have said, the industry is highly fragmented. But what I've seen is there's starting to be more collaboration among brands. And collaboration is really, really important. They're sharing data with one another. Aura Ring is sharing data with Bayes. Aura Ring is sharing data with Basis. They're sharing data, and they have to agree to do this to make a better consumer experience. And this is going to make the industry 
also easier to size in the future. And I, I smell mergers and acquisitions as well. And finally, the winners will use AI algorithms and Web3 to solve for the ultimate issue, which is motivation and behavior. So to borrow a theory from one of the world's leading behavioral scientists, BJ Fogg, in order to get somebody across the action line, to, to take an action, there must be enough motivation and there must be a, enough ease of ability. So the task must be made easy. And motivation as a marketer, as a business, is difficult to, to manipulate against your customer. But making something easy actually is easy to manipulate as a marketer, as a producer of a product. So we need solutions to be easy. The motivation is high. And we really need to get people across that line by making personalized nutrition easier. Thank you very much. I really look forward to talking to all of you afterwards. My name is Isabella Davis, and thank you so much. All right, thank you, Isabella. Excellent presentation. BJ Fogg, it's the tiny habits, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, little teeny things that you can do. All right, uh, I think we're gonna keep rolling, Stephen. So we'll take thank questions we... for both Rick and Isabella when we yeah, wrap up and get into our panel. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions later on. Uh, so our final presentation is from Karen Fazainen. She's partner at Axon Lawyers. Karen is a life sciences lawyer with a fo focus on functional foods and feed and pharmaceuticals. Her core expertise is to assist companies regarding the market introduction of innovations in this field. This includes the qualification of new ingredients and uh, advising on the appropriate regulatory pathway belonging there too, such as novel foods, GMOs and the like. And Karen is familiar with the authorities supervising these types of products and assists in enforcement actions when needed. Please. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, this is on. So we're going to do something different. It's no longer about trends and forecasts. We're going to talk about regulatory angles. And for those who think, oh gosh, this is going to be boring, I'm actually going to try to explain to you how do you get a marketable product in this space. A few words of background. Um, I'm a Dutch lawyer working uh, with a focus on the EU. So here's a disclaimer. We're not focusing on the US, but there will be a link in this presentation to the US. We advise companies with, uh, well, making, having their product make it to the market. We work with commercial contract and we litigate when need may be. And what I like to do as a lawyer is um, to really grasp the puzzles that companies ask us to solve, to find a definition, what it is actually from a legal view, personalized nutrition. But then I uh, found pretty quickly that there isn't any legal definition of personalized nutrition. So I went to look for a scientific one which dates back to 2019 and stems from the American Society of Nutrition. And I like this one because it's very precise what it is about when we talk about personalized nutrition. It's about individual specific information obtained by science-based um, results, which uh, promote hopefully a dietary change, which then hopefully results into measurable health benefits. And I emphasize the measurable because this is one of the aspects I would like to talk today about. First, I would like to point you to a pretty recent initiative, which was launched in the Netherlands. It's a position paper published by Food Valley Netherlands. Um, and they also worked on a common definition of personalized nutrition because they said it will help the businesses if it's really clear what we are talking about. So this paper, which was an initiative of over 40 uh, stakeholders, including both uh, companies and uh, scientific actors, is focusing on the business, sorry, the science needed to actually measure the health benefits, the business opportunities it creates, and the applicable regulatory framework. And this is what we're going to talk about now. Basically, there's three things you need to know 
because even if we talk uh, about nutrition, depending on the way you are positioning your product, it may qualify as a medicinal product or even a medical device. Um, when you are talking about your product, you probably would like, you're very enthusiastic about it, you would like to share all the health benefits, but you need to know that there's a specific framework to that. Finally, and I think it already became clear from the presentation from Rick and uh, Isabella, uh, processing personal data is an important aspect of it, and I'll slightly touch upon that as well. So, when we talk about product qualification, it is important to remember that the way you present your product is actually key, because depending on that presentation, it could either be a food product, medicinal product, or a medical device. And uh, this will be decisive for the applicable regulatory framework. To help you explain this a little bit, I've uh, designed a slide um, defining the three different types of products as well as their uh, market entry requirements. To start at the left, a food product, what is that basically? It's a product that is meant to be uh, ingested by humans. It also includes drinks, obviously, also chewing gum, by the way, but deliberately not medicinal products. In principle, you do not need any prior market authorization, but there are some exceptions. For instance, novel foods and GMO products. Medicinal products are products that basically improve physical functions by either a pharmacological, an immunological, or a metabolic action. It could also be products um, making a certain diagnosis, but we won't focus on these today. Obviously, in order to market a medicinal product, you do need prior market uh, clearance. Then we have a look at uh, the definition of medical devices. They have some medical aspects, but what I would like you to remember is that their primary action is not achieved by a medical um, function, so not by a pharmacological, immunological or metabolic action. Think about an app, for instance. There's no pharmacological effect, but it's, it's, this is why it qualifies as a medical device. Normally, you do not need to have a prior uh, market clearance. It needs to have in the EU a CE mark, and depending on the risk class, you may require um, a more thorough safety assessment. So, this is pretty clear, right? Not so difficult. Nevertheless, uh, in practice, there are quite some borderline products regarding which it is not so clear at all. And I've picked two landmark cases. One is even going back to the 80s. It relates to a Dutch national called Van Bennekom. And he was importing into the Netherlands large quantity of vitamin pre uh, preparations. They were having a pharmaceutical form, so um, you can think of pills. And actually he was caught at the border because he didn't have a market authorization. He did not deny the fact that he was having these large quantities of pills, but he said, no, it's not medicinal products, it's food. And what you may remember from this decision is that it is not really not only about the function of your product, but also about the presentation thereof. And since they had a pharmaceutical form, in order to protect the consumer, um, well, it is said that he might very well conceive these are medicinal products, and um, you don't want to end up there uh, marketing a food product. So make sure that you don't communicate as if it were a medicinal product because you might end up in the spectrum where a whole set of different rules apply. Moving over to the red rice example, um, this is a food supplement uh, currently still being on the market. I recently checked and um, it contains a high level of monolin K, which in fact is an inhibitor of um, well, cholesterol synthesis. And because of this uh, active ingredient, it qualified, according to the German authorities, because it's a case stemming from Germany, it qualified as a medicinal product by function. So then again, by communicating that your product can, um, well, treat a certain disease, 
alleviate certain symptoms, you might also end up in the medicinal spectrum where you would like to stay away of when marketing a food product. A final one on um, medical devices and the, the Dutch participants amongst us may recognize a famous singer here, uh, René Vroger, who actually participated in um, well, a pub campaign and it says, it's in Dutch, do you want to lose weight as well? René already lost 11 kilograms. And it was a case in front of the uh, med medical uh, advertising board uh, which is a self-regulatory organization and the complaint which be in front of this body could either stem from a consumer or a company was that it is not allowed to state for a food product that it helps you uh, losing this amount of weight. It is different, however, from medical devices because um, certain of those products are very much targeting at weight management or losing weight. So what you can say for a medical device, you can't for a food product. So it's pretty much important to know what product you are actually marketing. Let's move over to consumer communication. Um, at the start, I mentioned that companies marketing these products really like to shout it out loud what their product can achieve but even if it have certain positive um, aspects you can't communicate it just like that you need to know in the first place and i hope i made that clear already that you can't do any medical claims for your food product but you also need to be aware of the spectrum of health and nutrition claims and in order to explain this, I've also created a small chart. First of all, nutrition claims are claims explaining what is in the product. And as an example, it's for instance, a high in protein, whereas a health claim states what does the product actually do? It, it emphasizes the effect of the product. And here is an example of an authorized health claim relating to linoleic acid contributing to the maintenance of normal cholesterol uh, levels. These claims are uh, both allowed, provided that of course you meet the conditions, they should be linked to particular compounds, and you should stay within the spectrum of authorized uh, wording. Now, a medical claim is usually targeting um, enhancing certain situations, improving certain uh, physical effects, you can't make those, as I already mentioned, for food products. Basically, there are only two exceptions relating to medical foods, where obviously you need to be able to communicate what disease they are actually targeting at, and for the so-called disease risk reduction claims. These are health claims as well, but there are only very few of them. I think in Europe only about 14 or 15, for which you need to file a dossier. You really need to demonstrate that your products contribute at a disease risk reduction. Okay. Now I would like to involve you in order to check uh, if I've explained well and also in order to check how smart you are. So how about this one? Read this claim and tell me who thinks this is an authorized health claim? Hands up, please. Okay. So who thinks this is an unauthorized health claim? <laughs> Well, I can tell you, um, this is actually um, a claim being used um, uh, by Unilever relating to a product, uh, a margarine, which in Europe is called Basel. I think in the UK it's called Flora. So this is an authorized one for um, well, margarine spread on uh, barley beta glucans. And as you can see, it doesn't say it improves a health situation, it says that uh, well, it mitigates a risk factor, and that's the best you can do when we're in the field of uh, nutrition claims. Another one. Calcium improves muscle function. Is this an allowed one? What do you think, Rick? Rick thinks it might be permitted. Anyone else who would like to say something about that? Do you think it's authorized or not? It's actually not because it said 
it improves a muzzle function where you already pretty quickly move into the, the medical field. A similar one is iodine is important for the cognitive development and enhances learning capacity. You can see you pretty quickly move into the medical field, right? So you can't do it this way if you want to do it in a proper way. The last one, however, is the way it should be done. I admit it is a little bit less sexy, but um, hey, this is how the system works so far. The most tricky ones are, I already briefly mentioned them, the so-called disease risk reduction claims. And I took an example from the field of uh, CBD, which is a cannabinoid, uh, having said to have many positive effects on health. However, so far there wasn't any approved health claim yet. And as you can read at the bottom, a small selection of statements, it reduces stress, ensures a good night's nice rest, sleep, provide energy, increases resistance. All of these, I'm sorry to say, these are not authorized health claims. Okay, final set of slides uh, are touching upon the processing of personal data. What are, what are personal data according to the GDPR? It's any information relating to an individual. Um, a, sp a specific type of personal data is data concerning health. And this is what we are talking about, right? When we're talking about personalized notation, this is a relevant category. And here I spelled it out, it is any data relating to, well, physical or mental health, uh, of a natural person, even uh, the state of care he or she received, and um, any information um, relating to his or her health status. Then the final important one, processing personal data. Well, it's about everything you can do with personal data. Okay, if there's one thing I would like you to remember regarding this presentation, it touches upon this difference because processing data is permitted provided that you have a proper legal basis, for instance, a contract, for instance, um, it's necessary for scientific research. However, if you want to process data concerning health, this is the other way around. It is in principle prohibited unless, unless you have a proper legal data to do that. And um, this is really important for the actors in this field because you need to secure this consent of consumers. You need to be able to demonstrate, for instance, by a tick in a box which you then have back office, that they do agree with processing of their data. Um, when I say you need to demonstrate they do agree, we talk about in legal way that the consumer provides his consent. And this, under the GPR, is pretty specific as well. First of all, it should be freely given, um, meaning that it's a real option, and if the consumer wants to obtain certain services, it can't be a package deal. Uh, it should be specific, so what does it relate to? What action can you use the data for? Um, the consumer should be well informed what will happen to my data. Will you only be using them for this service? Or might it be an option that you'll be using them for another things in the future as well? Finally, it should be unambiguous, meaning that it requires a clear statement or, as we call it in legal terms, an affirmative act. It's important to note that um, obtaining consent for processing personal data is not the same as obtaining a consent for uh, using data in clinical trials. Of course, one is linked to the other, but you need to obtain a separate consent for processing personal data, even if you're running a clinical trial. Okay, how does this work in practice? It, the framework seems to be pretty clear, so you would expect that companies do understand how it works and to apply it. I found this example relating to a company um, selling food supplements and means of diagnosis. It's a UK-based company, um, but since it is targeting uh, EU consumers, it should stick to the EU rules as well. 
How does it work? Well, if for instance you want to measure if you have certain deficiencies, for example in vitamin D, you can simply send a drop of blood which will be analyzed in the lab and then they will send you their data. So what would you expect that they, that they use as a legal basis? They are processing health data, so they should secure an extra solid basis to do that. Well, I found this is not the case, because what they are mentioning as a legal basis is their legitimate interest which can be a legal basis. Um, for instance, if you need consumer data to serve a consumer contract. However, when you're processing personal data, uh, which are health data, it is not sufficient. So this is just one example of a company who still had to get up to speed. I don't want you to make the same mistake, so do get it straight. Another important thing is when you're working, when you're using, for instance, uh, Google databases and storing data in the cloud, please be, be aware that the service may be um, positioned in the US, implicating a data transfer from the EU to the US. Now you may have heard that, well, this used to be covered by a so-called privacy data shield, but there has been a case in the EU in 2020 initiated by an Austrian individual called Jürgen Schrems. And um, basically the result of that was that the privacy data shield does not offer sufficient protection. And the good news is that there is a new principal agreement between the EU and the US that they're going to work on it, but it's pretty recently published in April uh, this year. We're not that far yet. So keep on focusing on these developments because it is serious stuff. If, if you're not doing it right, uh, you are at risk at important fines, and if you want to um, to get some inspiration where you would like to stay away of, you can uh, check out this data tracker mentioning all the, uh, the fines given so far, and um, quite often there are more than six digits. So it's serious stuff to get it right. I'm going to wrap up. Um, uh, when marketing a product, do know what products you do have. Is it a food product? Indeed, even if you want it to be, make sure it really is. Um, so when advertising it, sticks to the rules that apply to the food field and not to those for medicinal products and medical devices. And make sure you get your data stuff, your personal data stuff right. Okay, we're moving into our panel discussion. We will also have uh, Karen and Isabella and Rick on hand to ask additional questions, but we'll start out with some commentary. Um, Stephen, I'm going to turn things over to you to bring our panelists up. Thanks again, Heather. So uh, I'm now going to be joined on stage by uh, three amazing panelists, and thanks again to all the three speakers we had before uh, for the amazing presentations. Um, so uh, joining me on stage will be Ken Israel, Mike Wakeman, and James Borley. So uh, Ken, is, Ken is the founder of uh, Innovation Nutrition Consulting and co-founder of Beyond Brands. He has uh, three decades of experience in contract manufacturing, product development, regulatory affairs and compliance, brand marketing and operations, holding senior level executive positions with industry leading firms throughout that time. And Ken serves food supplement brands with innovation, technical and regulatory support to better serve consumers and other stakeholders. Welcome to the panel, Ken. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at Vita Foods again. Then we have uh, Mike Wakeman. Uh, he's a healthcare business consultant and pharmacist with a master's degree in pharmaceutical analysis, nutritional medicine, and clinical oncology. Uh, he's currently completing a professional doctorate examining the effects of medications on micronutrient status. This led to the commercialization of an online personalized nutrition platform assessing the impact of life stage, uh, lifestyle and diet on micronutrient status. And just recently you've won the Nutra Ingredients Award. Yeah, so thank you very much. Congratulations on that one. And then last but not least, we have James Bolley. He's the uh, Chief Development Officer at Hologram Sciences. 
He leads partnerships for nutritional product development and delivery formats. He holds a PhD in biochemistry, along with 20 years of experience with DSM, with a focus on market development and innovation, new business models, and most recently in the field of personalized nutrition. Hologram Sciences have recently unveiled its new brand, Phenology, offering advanced home diagnostics, um, hormone tracking, and custom insights for women before, during, and after menopause. So welcome to the stage. So Ken, uh, let's, let's maybe start with you and some remarks from you around the growth of this market, uh, the drivers and the challenges we're facing, particularly to find ways uh, to address lifelong conditions that impact quality of life, um, but could be affected by nutrition. Sure, well, you know, this is a topic that, you know, I think all of us in the industry have an obligation to engage in and to be very thoughtful about. I'm gonna preface all of my comments that we've changed the nature of who we serve and who participates in the market through the pandemic. We no longer just have natural products consumers and everybody else. Everybody's a wellness consumer and everybody's a wellness company. If you're in the OTC drug business, RX, dietary supplements, vacations, gym, food, apparel, even the music you listen to. It's all about wellness now. So it's a very much changed market. What I'm seeing in personalization is that urgency and need are the primary drivers. Um, the greatest examples of effective personalization are in cancer treatment and serious disease mitigation. What we're doing in personalized nutrition, it's a billion dollars in the US out of about a $60 billion industry, so read less than 2%. We're serving the uber elite eagle consumer at this point. Um, it will probably double in market share and size over the next three years. That's the leading expectation. I'm gonna put out there, we're not there yet. We have a major disconnect between a very data-rich environment that some of the presenters outlined earlier and what the industry can deliver to the consumer. We're beginning to scratch the surface on customized dose form, but we're challenged at this point to really deliver against the customer's expectation. I'm also gonna challenge that the cost model is challenging. While there's early evidence that in cases like metabolic syndrome, personalization may function as much as 50% better than traditional nutritional therapies. That said, the cost is often two to 300% higher. That's a lot of money for a small marginal gain. Thanks very much, Ken. So Mike, could you maybe uh, share some thoughts about the healthcare connection, um, including chronic OTC and drug use and how that impacts nutrients, uh, nutrient levels and deficiency and why it's uh, so important to address. Yeah, so we've been looking at the impact that medications have upon new micronutrient status, and we found uh, over 4,000 incidences in the literature where medications impact upon micronutrients. In the UK, uh, there's a, a billion prescriptions dispensed. The top 20 medications are for 400 million prescriptions, and all of those impact upon the nutrient status, micronutrient status, or the microbiome in some way. If you look at over 60 year olds, there's 50% of those are on three or more medications. As you get older, generally speaking, you're gonna be taking more. So you're gonna get an incremental effect on the micronutrient status, the microbiome status over that period of time. And these people are on these medications for 10, 20, 30 years time. And this isn't something that's being taken into consideration at all by their healthcare professionals um, or even by th th their own level of knowledge. And so it's something that it, I think is really important to address. I was listening to um, a presentation yesterday talking about mental health and the impact that uh, supplements have. And it was very much a dose response curve. And the more you take, the more um, it seems as though you have an effect. What wasn't apparent with that is that most of these individuals who, who've got psychoses, who are depressed or whatever, are heavily medicated very often. And so giving a small amount of a micronutrient is probably only going to get them to where they should be to start off with. 
That's why probably the bigger doses are representative of the true effect that a micronutrient or a supplement is having over and above uh, just correcting that imbalance that's been caused by the medication. So I think that's something that needs to be taken into consideration in terms of the way patients are managed. Thank you, uh, Mike. And finally, James, could you maybe also share some perspective and your thoughts about the uh, commercialization opportunity and the challenges? Yeah, thank you. And um, actually, really good, great segue uh, from Mike on, on the challenges around how do we scale this? And I, I think I agree with you. We're, we're not there yet. And I think that's one thing that we're very passionate about is how can we make personalized nutrition solutions more accessible to people, to end users? And one of the approaches that we're taking is to really focus on, and you, you also refer to it, need states. So trying to identify, uh, and it sounds a bit of a cliche, but these unmet needs, uh, and then uh, identify those needs that can be influenced through so some kind of personalized advice and a combination with a, a personalized product and some kind of diagnostic. And, and actually menopause, I think, is a really great example. Our research on, con our consumer research highlighted that women were extremely frustrated with a lack of support through menopause and a lack of opportunity to, to treat the symptoms. Uh, and that, you know, that's an ideal need state. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a disease, but it's something that we can dramatically improve through a personalized experience. And we, we basically design those, we design concepts around these need states, uh, test them in the market quickly, and then the scale, hopefully, will come by licensing those concepts out to brand owners who then have the consumer reach to take them forward. Thank you, James. So uh, if, we, if we take a step back and uh, start with the science, perhaps maybe, um, how can we, um ensure that recommendations for individual uh, consumers are truly personalized when a great deal of that science uh, on nutrient effects have been done on a homogenous population. So maybe Ken, Mike, I don't know who you, who you want to start. Yeah, I think you're right. It, that, that it has been done in a homogenous population. Um, it's very difficult. A lot, of the, a lot of the research that's been done hasn't even quantified the, for example, vitamin D levels or micronutrient status when a person even starts a trial. Um, and, but they've looked at the clinical effect. Some of those people are gonna be completely deficient, others are gonna be completely replete. You give them the same dose, and not surprisingly, you end up with this mishmash of results um, that is very difficult to interpret. And I think that's something that's incumbent upon us as, as supplement producers and supplement marketeers is to explain a lot of those imbalances and a lot of those uh, areas where we, we fail to deliver in terms of the structure of the clinical studies. I think they're becoming much more uh, well structured now, but historically taking data and doing a meta-analysis, for example, on data that hasn't even, where the patients haven't even been quantified in terms of their personal nutrition status, and then trying to interpret that data, I think is, is, is flawed, basically. And when I look at the protocols that are being developed now, they're taking that much more into account. So I think you're gonna get a much more homogeneous population moving forwards, but a lot of the data, as you said, has been, is being used is in heterogeneous populations. And it's very often um, biased in terms of sex, in terms of, um, in, in terms of the origins of the, the, of the people. Um, you know, they've just all been mixed together. And as you mentioned earlier, if you look at the, uh, the data that's being generated now in cancer treatments, people are identifying, it's like it's gene testing to be able to determine whether or not you're going to be given that type of medication. Um, so we're a long way from that yet, but I think that's, that's the way we need to be going. I, I agree with everything you said, and I'd like to kind of flip the lens, if you will, and look at it from the market towards the industry. More than 50% of users of personalized nutrition programs, these are survey-based, not very objective, very subjective data. When we start looking at where the data really digs in, effectively, genetic polymorphisms can affect the metabolism of certain nutrients. I think some of the biggest examples, you know, are you a good methylator? 
well, that might determine, okay, do I need a methylated folic acid or a methylated uh, B12, et cetera, for e efficacy in the body. Um, we also are doing an awful lot in the personalized space on microbiome. I challenge everybody in this room to tell me what a healthy microbiome looks like, please. It hasn't been identified yet. Yet, we're trying to modify, manipulate, remodel, and we don't know what the baseline is yet. So this is not so thoughtful. We do certainly have evidence that certain strains, live or dead, certain foods for them, prebiotics, combinations thereof, symbiotics, postbiotics, which are the byproduct or the end product of bacterial activity, yeast activity, phage activity in the microbiome can deliver specific results, but I think we're very early days and we really need to listen to the science. Mike, I applaud your comment on we're lumping together data that's mostly from guys like me, white, middle-aged or older men and that does not apply to women. We really need to be much more thoughtful about women-specific data, about ethnically-specific data. We have, human beings are not all the same. There's enough variation between us that the science, we, we need to demand more from the science. Uh, just to add one, just build on that a little bit. Uh, I think one of the, the beautiful opportunities of personalized nutrition is that that, of course, does give us an opportunity to go down to the level of an individual. And especially if there's a diagnostic available, you can, you can then start to decipher that, right? Vitamin D status of person A, different from person B. Uh, and, and you actually start to see that through those personalized nutrition approaches. Uh, so I think that's also a great opportunity from a scientific perspective. Yeah, that actually brings me to my next question. If we look at ourselves on the stage here, it's just men sitting here. So uh, a lot of the science has been done on men and uh, not so much uh, on, 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 on women. And um, yeah, how can we effectively bring more women into the space and, and also into the science? And maybe phenology is actually a very interesting uh, example uh, around menopause. And I think the entire management team uh, is, is, is run by uh, women exclusively. So maybe do you want to start on that one? Yeah, so definitely a disclaimer, I'm really not brilliantly qualified to talk about this, but, um, but at the same time, I, I work for a company who now has a female leadership team that uh, have launched a, a menopause concept. It's like super exciting. So Jess Graham, who's the GM of that concept, you know, she really, she conceived the idea. And again, uh, the, the, the great advantage of a personalized approach is that you can also approach people in a personalized way, right? So we can proactively approach women with personalized nutrition concepts. Doesn't have to be menopause. There are many other things that would also appeal and be of, be of help. And, and through that personalized approach, we, we can actually reach out to them and, and bring them in to the space. Uh, I think phenology is a, a great first step and, and there'll be many other opportunities beyond that as well. You know, I, I, I don't have so much to add on this, but I am seeing some interesting emerging data in the beauty from within category, which has become quite important. And there seems to be a developing nexus in skin microbiome, um, as well as general beauty from within claims and deepening attention to both men's specific and women's specific solutions. Um, PMS and personalized nutrition, I think, is a magnificent opportunity. But overall, we absolutely need to demand more of ourselves, more of the industry, more of the companies, and certainly more of the um, journals in eliminating this bias because it's underserving more than half of the customers. I'm not sure how many of you here are from the UK, but you'll probably know that it's, it's quite a forge at the moment in terms of there's a real shortage of HRT. I don't know whether that's a worldwide thing, but that's certainly looking, I think will encourage more people to look at nutrition and personalized nutrition. The other area, and I don't want to bang on about medication, but it's one area, a lot of women are, are, are medicated throughout their life on the pill. And the pill impacts upon significantly upon a lot of micronutrients, especially folic acid. So for example, in the States, there's a contraceptive pill that contains folic acid as well. So I think there's a, there's a, a huge need to involve more women. And then talk about 
menopause, obviously a lot of women will move on from the pill to HRT. So therefore, they, they spent 20, 20, maybe 20 years medicalized uh, with treatments that are going to impact upon their micronutrient status. So it isn't an answer to your question, but it really does highlight the need to get more women into this research space. <clears throat> so from a basic perspective, um, how, how can we uh, increase awareness among the public that dietary uh, changes can benefit their health? Is there a follow-up from the pandemic? Um, I'm going to offer that the general public, at least in the US, which is my primary market, um, and also in some of the Western European markets that I serve, the pandemic clearly taught the consumer that everybody is responsible for their own wellness. And just as much as there's been a morphing from, you know, I, was, well, I would say traditional consumers and natural products consumers to everybody being a wellness consumer, um, this personal responsibility has increased the number of supplement users, the amount of supplements they use, the frequency of use. Everybody's jumped forward on this curve and that's driven the growth that the industry has seen and that the industry will continue to see. So I think we're doing a great job. I think we're publishing the data. I look at some of the organizations within the trade. Um, some of the single ingredient or ingredient cluster advocacy groups are doing a brilliant job telling their story and driving consumer well-being. Yeah, um, just building on that, I, I would agree. The one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic has been that uh, people in general are much more comfortable testing themselves for things, right? If you'd have told me two years ago that I'm going to be sticking swabs up my nose once a week, I, I would have looked at you fairly strangely. But most people are now quite comfortable with the idea of performing some sort of in-home test. And again, that you know, that's that's really a step change, and really, I think, paves the way for more personalised approach where we can int integrate certain diagnostics. So. It, I mean, the pandemic was terrible, don't get me wrong, but in some ways that is a bit of a silver lining that we can, over time, improve people's health through a more personalized approach. Um, so how can communication um, with consumers around personalized nutrition solutions, solutions match the regulatory framework? You know, this is a tricky question. Um, data privacy, data security, as our previous presenter mentioned, um, is incredibly important. In the United States, you have HIPAA regulation, Health Information Privacy Act. Um, in Europe, you have the general data protection requirements. And unfortunately, compliance is not robust. Um, the second big issue is our industry has a rich and storied track record of over-promising and under-delivering on products and claims. So if we're going to maintain credibility, if we're going to be trusted, and credibility and trust are the foundation to growth, we need to do a better job as an industry. Um, trust Transparency Network, their booth upstairs, is doing beautiful efforts on that behalf. Um, trade associations like Natural Products Association in the US I think are doing a fabulous job. I'm biased. I've been sitting on the Comply Committee for 18 years now. Um, we have our work cut out for us. I think we really need to look at personalized nutrition as a new opportunity to do better. I think I agree. And, and also, if you're looking at internationalizing this, which most companies are doing, then you've got to take into consideration, we had a, an excellent presentation about the EU, which is very different, as you mentioned, to the US, very different to Australia and Asia. So it's how do you accommodate all, that, all those differing needs into one package that you can make truly international? Yeah, and I think um, as a... In the case of companies playing this space, we have a responsibility to make sure that we adhere to and stay within the boundaries of the respective regulatory frameworks, right? So that means stay, you know, keep your concepts within the boundaries of health claim, relevant health claims, and within the boundaries of data privacy. Uh, and it's not simple if you have to comply with GDPR and HIPAA. That we've, you know, we found that quite a heavy lift. And I would actually welcome 
you know, I would I welcome monitoring of the situation to make sure that it's a, a level playing field and that and that companies do do stick to that, uh, and then support from experts to help us navigate it because it's not always simple. I will be work on an ongoing basis with uh, consumers so that it's not a single test uh, point in time, but finding ways to gather hard data and use that to incentivize uh, compliance. And uh, is this possible as most nutrient interventions take years or decades and their effect may never be known? So, I think this is a difficult one because being able to quantify at micronutrient status is, is very difficult. I mean, you look at things like magnesium. So little magnesium is in the serum um, and the sensitivity and the specificity of these tests is, is, is really important. And I, 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 I can't remember which, pre which presenter put this, the, the, uh, the slide up looking at this. And I think sensitivity and specificity are... The, a lot of people have got sensitivity, but they haven't got specificity. Um, and that's, it's about having those two and delivering them at a high level. Um, and uh, it's one of those situations, we've heard it so many times so far, we're not there yet. It's, it's unfortunate. We are with some... some uh, parameters like vitamin D, for example, blood, blood tests, blood spot tests are, are fine. Um, but for other micronutrients, I think we're still a long way in terms of being able to determine accurately and using them as a diagnostic as well for, for the consumer's benefit. I can't agree with you more. And I think once again, looking at the data that industry develops, there's probably four or 5,000 ingredients on this trade show floor that claim clinical evidence, clinical support, substantiation, and I doubt there's 10 that have studies that went longer than 90 days. <laughs> Think about that. There's some interesting follow-on work that's been published. There was a great study on selenium and coenzyme Q10, and they re-engaged with the patients 10 years after the study was complete and found that an epigenetic change had taken place. And that even though these people had stopped using the supplement, all of them had lower cardiovascular disease risk. So we're just beginning to scratch the surface on what the longer term implications of nutrients are. I pointed out a positive case. There are also some rather challenging cases. Beta carotene supplementation is a standalone I don't think the data is robust there. In fact, it's a little bit concerning. So we need to be fair and honest and look ourselves in the mirror. And once again, I've said it 20 times, how can we do better? We need to tackle these challenges. Yeah, and, and maybe uh, looking at it through the eyes of a, of a consumer or an end user, what we found is it's, it is incredibly difficult to, um, for, for a person to stay with a, a particular concept for the entire length of their life cycle, right, their lifespan. Uh, what we found, I think, over the years is that what seems to work best is if you can offer um, sort of particular solutions to particular problems, and then a person can, can dip into, say, an immunity solution for a period of time. They may then li leave that solution, but then come back later to, let's say, the menopause solution, and, and, and that also is time-bound. So what we found um, working in this space is that really time-bound and target-based solutions tend to um, engage best uh, for consumers rather than a, a single lifelong concept. So if we're talking uh, barriers, uh, accelerators, uh, what, do you, what do you think uh, might be the biggest barriers and accelerators for innovation in this space, thinking about government uh, policy? technology or consumer attitudes? Yeah. I'm going to go a little off course here because it's something I wanted to kind of squeeze in somehow. In the United States, we have a piece of pending legislation, Senate Bill 4090, which is the mandatory product listing. This could create a massive barrier to entry for nutritional products, especially in personalized nutrition, um, making it to market. So of concern, write your senator if you're from the US, if you have U.S. customers, tell them to write their senators and their congresspeople. That aside, the regulatory environment, the FDA is not doing such a great job. There's been chaos, there's been areas of neglect and areas of overzealousness. On the industry side, 
getting our value proposition, as I pointed out in my opening comments, aligned with the benefit we can provide is incredibly important. Democratizing what we offer, I applaud what DSM did and Hologram specifically with their new vitamin D, um, creating a product that's demonstrably more effective, that they provide it with a test that makes it open and accessible at a really important time. I think that was a synergy and a coincidence but getting you know, Americans and Europeans vitamin D status better during the global pandemic where vitamin D is absolutely a determinant in outcomes is brilliant work. So I applaud what you guys are doing and I'm gonna hold you, your team up as an example of how to do it right. I can't really add much more to that. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, uh, appreciate that shout out, really do. Um, and uh, actually it's a nice segue onto barrier, one of the key barriers. So purely selfishly, uh, from a selfish perspective, the, one of the key barriers we face is um, robust, easy to use diagnostic technologies, right? The ho and we, we heard about it earlier with wearables and tracking. I think the holy grail for us is a non, you know, non-invasive devices that can assess micronutrient intake. Wouldn't that be incredible? Um, and we, we're not there yet. We're some way off. And until then, we we tr we have to deal with kind of the next best. Uh, but that when when that whoever comes up with that, you know, that is going to be a game changer for personalized nutrition. So uh, DSM has been mentioned, and uh, some there's some other companies out there, obviously in the space. So what type of firms do you uh, expect will lead the shift in the market? Is it possible that big tech could move into the space and pose a threat to traditional product manufacturers or uh, are OTC and supplement firms in a position to add that tech and data capability? I think you saw from the presentation, the, the second presentation, in terms of the, the amount of money that's being raised in this sector. And, the people who've got the money to do that are the people who've got the resources to, to, to do it, basically. So I think it will be the bigger companies that will impose themselves. The other thing I thought was really interesting was this, at the moment, everything's fragmented. It's bringing it together. And I'm sure that someone's got the resource there to be able to do that. I think that was really important. Um, it's, at the moment, it's very disparate. It's not joined up. And I think consumers are looking for this joined upness, as you said, that a way that they can they can interpret this. It's too complicated for them at the moment. They want something simple to understand and they need it all to be joined up for them and to be given it to them in a palatable format. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm not so sanguine for the future opportunity for small players in this space for very much the same reasons. Um, I think Apple Health, Google, Facebook, um, the global giants, ultimately stand the best chance. They know how to collaborate, they, they know how to merge massive fields and clouds of data. They already have the massive clouds and fields of data on each one of us. Um, it doesn't take too much to commercialize and operationalize that. And I think, honestly, looking at humans and our interactions and how we tend to behave like those in our peer circles um, is incredibly informative about health. If your active lifestyle, eating well, you know, vegan, cyclist, etc., chances are a lot of your friends look like you. And if you're a beer drinking couch potato, chances are your friends look a lot like you. So looking at these social interactions, networks, the data, you know, data, your purchasing habits, you know, if I was Amazon, Apple, Google, et cetera, you know, you're sitting in the driver's seat right now and it wouldn't take much. It's change lost in the couch for them to take the whole industry. Yeah, the, I think the only thing I'd add, I mean, it's an interesting one, right? I think no doubt uh, those companies, you know, will be looking to move into this space, but it's, it's not necessarily a threat. I mean, it could be an opportunity. They, they can't, they probably can't do it on their own because they're not, usually in nutrition. So for the nutritional solutions, I think they, there are going to be partnerships. They're going to have to be partnerships, maybe acquisitions. Um, but, you know, potentially an opportunity for small nutrition companies or big nutrition companies to partner up. 
Um, are, are, are we at the point to move from uh, what used to be one size fits all uh, generic advice to, to that which is tailored to an individual? Um, how do we handle the challenges of for true personalization from uh, a manufacturing point of view or regulatory implications? Or will advice that's uh, tailored to groups of similar individuals remain as personalized as it gets? I think one of the, the issues that we, we haven't touched upon here um, about influencers, uh, it was mentioned about persona, is the influence of the medical profession. And they have no, very little training in the area of nutrition. And I think that's, that's something that needs to change. Um, if we look at gene testing, that's going to be predictive of, di of disease and lifestyle interventions are going to be so important there. So that's something, again, that doctors are going to have to come to terms with. Um, the personalized nutrition element of it is going to be part and parcel of that. So people are going to be engaging in this technology at a much earlier stage in their life. They're going to be looking for polymorphisms, as you said. They're going to be screening. They're going to be doing all that sort of thing at a much earlier stage in their life. Um, and hopefully, uh, a lot of the drug companies <laughs> will be looking at sort of more, I don't know how they, but, but the, the interventions are going to be, they're going to engage with the interventions a lot earlier. And hopefully the, the medication that we're talking about today, I'm not saying it's going to disappear, but it is going to be reduced somewhat. Because people are taking, as you said, post-COVID, people are taking much more responsibility for their lifestyles. I, um, I actually see what's relevant and low-hanging fruit for most people to be fairly basic stuff. You know, the contents of a good quality multivitamin, omega-3 fatty acids, healthy minerals, basic sense about lifestyle choices, this doesn't require an awful lot of personalization and it can deliver the vast majority of the benefit. As we age, as we start using medications, this data cloud around us is going to provide some great insights, especially nutrient, botanical, drug interactions. I think there's a rich field there and integration of medical care and daily lifestyle, diet, food choices, food personalization, etc. This will become a really interesting space, but on outside of chronic conditions or other issues, I think it's not terribly complicated. Yeah, I, I guess from my side, it's perhaps a slightly idealistic view, but I honestly I believe that the that this the technology will drive this. Um, we're seeing improvements in diagnostics. We're seeing improvements in nutrient delivery. I think as that evolves you know, five to 10 years from now, I, I do think that um, a, a much more personalized experience is gonna be the norm. Uh, and if I look at today, standing in front of a typical drugstore shelf and, and just look at the mass of confusing products that are out there, I do think that that's gonna change. And in five, 10 years from now, people will, will be having personalized products and personalized experience. Well, um, I see we've got uh, 15 minutes left, so uh, I'd like to open uh, the questions to the audience. And we'll also bring our speakers uh, yes. on, on okay. stage as well. On. Can you hear? Uh, no. Hello. 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 Ah, I have to. This way? This. Oh, OK. This, these are convenient microphones. So this is noted for next year. Order more handheld. Um, do we have any questions here in the audience? For anyone who'd like to uh, comments, yeah. Thanks, Heather. Um, is that okay? Ah, oh, super. Um, so, guys, um, there was a there was a point in the discussion where we were talking about a deficit of um, of basic basic data around nutritional status, and um, so one of the things that wasn't mentioned was some of the large data sets that we currently have. Obviously, we have the NDNS from the UK which is a rolling data set, and then we have NHANES as well from the US. So is the implication here that we need to get more scientific studies from the industry um, and independent scientific bodies, or can we use what we have existing and perhaps do more screening in the population? Is this a question of government stepping in and grabbing more of that data or sharing? Um, it's an open question. You can agree or disagree. 
you know, I think as a matter of public policy, um, mining the data sets that we have is a wise choice. Um, so you point out something that, you know, that this is a, this is a low hanging opportunity. How relevant it is to this specific conversation, personalized nutrition, Nutra, Pharma, what's happening in the total space, I'm not sure how much we learn from that now because I don't think the data is so rich when it comes to drug use, supplement use, and food use. But there's definitely data and, and key learnings that can be derived from it. I'd agree. Um, I, I think that you mentioned the, 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 the UK database. Yeah, it's, it's, it's representative, but how representative is it of the changing population in terms of ethnicity? Um, it's, it's a finger in the air exercise more than anything else. And obviously it's mainly built around food intake. Um, very little in terms of uh, monitoring people's actual blood levels of micronutrients or whatever. So it's a, it's a useful indicator, but it's, it's not very, I don't think it's very accurate. I see it as a combined approach, right? I think for us, like when, when we want to embark on designing a personalized nutrition solution, um, it's incredibly help, helpful to have those data sets to help us focus in a particular area. So vitamin D is a great example. Omega-3, we know a lot about omega-3 omega deficiencies. So we can use that as a starting point, design a, a personalized solution around that, and then we, through that personalized solution, we start get, gathering new data on the same micronutrients, which we can then pair up with the original data set and, and hopefully get new insights. Uh, you, you mentioned vitamin D earlier, so we have a vitamin D concept um, that's now in market for a year, and we've got thousands of new data points where people have tested themselves, and that, you know, that's a rich, a rich new vein of learning opportunity for, for these deficiencies. Yeah, there's one more question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, probably also some comments from Corinne as well would be great. Um, I guess um, some of what's been talked about here probably suggests that quite a lot of what is being sold as personalized nutrition is in fact demographic nutrition um, per se. And A, does that meet the legal requirement <laughs> from your position of being personalized nutrition? and be maybe more widely to the, the panel then, how do you think you overcome those elements? And is, is it that demographic element that we need as opposed to the personalized, the truly individual 119032B or whatever I might be um, in, a, in a sort of study? That's a your question. Let's see how this works. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is easier indeed. Well, I, I'm modest enough as a lawyer to um, uh, state that uh, difference models, they, they don't get born in law firms, right? So you need to have the business first and then you see what is the applicable uh, regulatory framework. However, I do think it makes sense if you take the size of steps in your business model, engaging with a new partner, starting a production plant, then to dive into that regulatory framework, because indeed, there may be some difference on one side, on the ocean, and on the other. We have any further questions? Questions, comments? Comments. Yeah. We got one here, okay. Hi. Uh, yes, so a lot of the platforms and solutions in personalized nutrition actually ask for the customers to change behavior, change their lifestyle in some sense, or have at least some sort of intervention. And how, how, do, how does the industry deal with compliance? And do you think they're up to the par or there's really a lot of work to do in figuring out what the research tells about uh, behavioral changes? And should these players uh, play a more active role in research to get the edge for, uh, for improving compliance? I, I'd love to jump in. I, I think that um, personalization, especially with the use of testing, um, be it um, blood spot, wearable device, um, and also um, biome testing, 
in a way, it's almost like gamification of nutrition where you're setting your bar and everybody wants a better score. Everybody wants to see the cholesterol to go down, the weight go down, the VO2 max go up, et cetera, et cetera. So there's definitely by, you know, you can only manage what you measure. And personalized nutri nutrition encourages measurement and remeasurement. Um, again, giving um, DSM and the hologram and their vitamin D program, they don't send one test kit, they send two. <laughs> so you're measuring at the beginning and at the end of an intervention. This is helpful, and I think that we can model this. I'm really excited about the future of wearables um, and even semi-invasive wearables. Um, this morning there was a news story on um, a device that put put on your arm and it's measuring glucose and lactate and other other you know that can be coupled with an aura ring or a fitbit watch or apple watch and now you're again you're developing that cloud of data you can start observing results and drive performance i'm actually going to make a comment and i'd love to see if either rick or isabella would like to get me to steal a microphone from the stage because you both spoke about uh, the compliance aspect, the Netflix kind of concept, needing to get it all the time. And then you actually, Isabella, have the ecosystem and this idea of how do you bring all of your data points together to talk to each other. Would you have any follow-up comments? Yeah, so I think, I think that follows on quite nicely from Ken's comment around uh, gamification. So it's a similar concept with um, even what Isabella said around uh, the web 3.0 in the metaverse, you know, esports, gaming. Um, to, again, to, we didn't mention this, but that took a massive jump as well during the pandemic. You know, because we had nothing to do other than look at screens, really, and we couldn't socialise, we couldn't play real sports. Um, so. Uh, that, I think, is an element that, again, is yet to be fully realized and, again, appeals to that core audience, certainly from our own data, of young Gen Z consumers who are, again, very interested in health, um, despite maybe the, uh, uh, the key uh, demographic that really needs to be supported, maybe the aging consumer. Um, you know, you know it's who, do, who do you target and specifically what messages do you talk about in terms of you know getting them engaged and i think gamification and and that kind of netflix style approach is is way yes two things so i i didn't speak about it but that project i showed apex optimizers which was a collaboration with a lot of brands was actually born uh from these people seeing that gamers in the community uh, d didn't have, there, were, there was no element of health. And they were seeing many, uh, many uh, high profile people promoting NFTs and gaming and Web 3.0, and there was no element of health and wellness brought into that world yet. So they wanted to be the first project and their vision in the future is that it will be gamified. People will earn points based on how often they get up from their game and move around, how hydrated they are, so on and so forth. Another thing, I'm not claiming to be an expert in blockchain technology at all, but what I do know about it is that it would help brands share data with one another uh, without having to share the confidential data, but just share the necessary pieces of data with one another so that they can communicate properly and then have that central place where consumers can get very aggregated and actionable insights. Like that company basis is one to really look into. And I got to speak with the founder through being part of that uh, Apex Optimizers community. I'm going to add one more comment, by the way, and this goes back to some of the challenges of manufacturing doses for personalized nutrition and the migration of consumer experience with nutritional products. Most consumers' experiences with our products, they kind of suck. Most people don't like swallowing big tablets, capsules, soft gels. It's not pleasant. And there's a lot of people that don't engage with our industry because of this. We've seen the rise of the gummy. We've seen the rise of liquids and shots. And in fact, these may be easier to customize moving forward. So going back to your question, I think that there, this migration of delivery system may facilitate better customization and better personalization of dose form, and that will facilitate growth in the industry. No, great, great. And, and the topic of 
behavior change and adoption is, is huge, as we've just discussed. And we've, so we've talked about gamification, diagnostics, product delivery. I would just add a couple more. One is um, building community. So I think increasingly we see around concepts uh, um, like a community element coming in where users can compare their, their experiences and recommend things to each other. That's one. And the, and the other one then is, is fairly basic, is like providing access to a human nutrition advisor or, or medical expert um, that you can talk to in confidence through the platform or something like that. And I think it's going to require all of these because we all know how much of a challenge behavior change is and none of these on their own are going to be enough. It's going to have to be a combination of all of them. Hi, it's just kind of like a follow-up on what you said on manufacturing. I was thinking the more data you have, the more personalized you make your supplement, how do you see manufacturing changing to accommodate that personalization of a dosage form? I mean, it's the guy, yeah, you want the personal dosage form, but you can't make one for everyone. If you've got the solution, that's, that is the million dollar question, actually. And I think, Ken, you and I were talking about it last night, uh, two nights ago at dinner. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great topic. We don't have we don't have the solution yet to do that at mass, right? Um, I, I would bet that the solution will come from a, a startup somewhere, and we see we are seeing more and more of these technologies coming online. Uh, and at some point, yes, there'll be a, a step change. Again, it's one of those holy grails of being able to deliver solutions n at n equals one at mass right so we're not we're not there yet but i think it's only a matter of time uh there's a lot of technology out there that's that's going in that direction you know right now i can speak to the u.s dietary supplements industry basic compliance with good, good manufacturing practices is still a challenge and now we want to do very very small batches for millions and millions of people this is going to be a, a, a bit of a steep hill for us. There are, however, some very interesting tools already in market. Um, some of the liquid, um, you know, kind of customized shot formulas at home, those show promise. Micro tablets show, t show promise. 3D printing using cartridges of stable nutrient gels shows promise. So there are opportunities on the horizon. That said, they are extremely expensive. These cost three to four hundred percent more than a similar mass-produced dose form. So again, we're only catering to those that very, very tight demographic. So I think there's no more questions in the audience. Um, so I'd like to thank my panelists, Mike, Ken, James, big round of applause, and also our three speakers, Karen, Isabella, and Rick. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephen. Thank you to our chair as well. And thank you to all of you for joining us. <laughs>